right, welcome back, everybody. <clears throat> NASDAQ second quarter results out this morning with a beat on both the top and the bottom line. Earnings came in at 69 cents a share. That was a nickel better than the street was expecting. It came on revenue of $1.16 billion. And joining us right now is the NASDAQ CEO and chair, Adina Friedman. Uh, Adina, thanks for being here. It's great to be here. So it looks like a, a big part of the strength in your earnings came from this demand when it comes to fintech, just for things that you guys have been offering when it comes to fraud protections and compliance issues. Yeah, so we're really proud of the results for the quarter. We had 10% growth overall, a 29% growth in our index business, and then 16% growth in our fintech business. And that, of course, has been an area that we really focus on strategically. And as you mentioned, we have our anti-financial crime business, which grew 24% in the quarter. And then we also have um, the, the acquisition of Adenza, which really is Calypso and Axiom SL. And together, they grew over 20%. So it's been just a really, really exciting quarter for us. I think that the demand for, from our clients has been strong. We've had, we had 67 new clients sign up for our, our FinTech solutions, 100 up, upsells, and then four cross-sells, which is really starting to show the power of the platform. So we're very excited about that. And then we're also innovating. You know, we're bringing more AI into our products. Um, every quarter, we're launching new capabilities to, to streamline the processes that our clients go through and the workflows they have. Let, let's talk about AI. What, what specifically yeah. can you do now that you couldn't do, let's say, a year or two ago? Well, I, I think there, we've had a lot of algorithmic AI capabilities within NASDAQ for quite some time, but of course, Gen AI has been an area of real focus. So what we look at is how can we make the workflows for our clients more efficient? So within anti-financial crime, we've now rolled out across, I think it's about 250 of our clients now are using this tool that really helps um, take down the time to research potential criminal activity and research entities within within their banks uh, by about 90 percent. Uh, and so it's really exciting there. And then we also have a new tool that we launch in our investment platform that summarizes uh, the meeting minutes from pension boards, which then allows asset managers to kind of look at understanding the strategies that they might be partaking, and it gives them kind of a leg up in terms of their sales opportunities there. So those are the types of things that we do to try to ena enable AI inside the products. Your chart looks great for the year. One year, a gain of more than 23 um, percent. We've seen a lot of activity, a lot of excitement about IPOs coming back, and you've got the biggest IPO of the year that's happening today here at NASDAQ. But it comes a day after we've seen the biggest drop in tech stocks uh, since 2022. And, and it's got people a little bit on edge. I mean, it's been remarkably calm. It's been remarkably steady in terms of the upward climb for technology stocks, too. What do you see right now in terms of demand for IPOs and where the market stands? Yeah, so we've seen a slow progression of IPOs coming back into the market. We're so pleased to have Lineage come and IPO on NASDAQ today. So very excited about that. We've had a good week also with one stream and going public yesterday. So, but it has been a slow progression this year. And I think that's really still the result of uh, the monetary policy still, the cost of capital still being high, trying to understand when monetary policy could could um, kind of take down the cost of capital, as well as just the overall environment around us continues to be very dynamic. Generally, though, if you look at our index business, I think it's kind of a, a good bellwether. You know, we, our index business is up 29% year over year. So you still, as you mentioned, there has been strong progress. But every day is a little bit of an adventure in the markets. <laughs> um, and, uh, and this week, we've seen a fair amount of adventure. I mean, it's, it's such a strange situation when you look at IPOs. They, they want a strong stock market. They also want lower rates. Like, you look at both of those issues. <laughs> yes. What happens if they get the rate cut, but the <laughs> stock prices come down? Yeah. What, what's it's a, it's what's a, the calculus? It's a great question because, on the one hand, the reason why, of course, the reason why the Fed has kept a monetary policy as tight as it or, or as, as high as it has, I think that is because of the fact that we really wanted to bring down inflation. And, but now, as inflation is coming down, that also, because of the higher cost of capital, is also bringing down GDP growth. So it's a delicate dance that the Fed has to navigate in terms of when is the right time to start to ease off and bring down the cost of capital, meaning bringing down rates, without, you know, without it going, waiting too long for that economic, the GDP growth to really slow down too much. And I think that's the delicate dance. We're getting to the point, though, where you're seeing inflation at least approaching 2 percent. You're seeing the average consumer starting to have more challenge with the higher cost of capital. Um, and so I think that you're, you're, you're feeling like now is getting, getting to be the time where changes in monetary policy would probably be welcomed by the markets. What, what would you rather have, though, when you're looking at the IPO market, a strong market or lower interest rates? 
Well, I think the question is, are the interest rates really sustainable where they are, given the GDP growth of the country? Right now, we have a 2 to 2.5% two gap between what, where the interest rates are and what the overall fundamental growth of the country is. And that's a pretty big gap. So they could bring down the rates and still have really healthy markets. In fact, having a lower cost of capital for companies overall is going to be, could actually be a boost to growth. And so it's not necessarily a, an if, you know, an either or, it, it could end up being an and. It's less than a week since the biggest global IT outage that we've ever seen in, in, in history took place here. There were some markets overseas that had trouble starting up uh, because of the Microsoft CrowdStrike uh, implementation of that new line of code. There were no problems here. Yeah. NASDAQ opened on time. It was great. Um, if you looked at other airlines, there were massive outages around the globe. Some of those companies got up and running more quickly than others. Delta still kind of having some delays and issues that have been out there. And people say that it was because it was so reliant, so heavily reliant, maybe more than half of its systems reliant on Microsoft for that. You've always uh, talked about the importance of redundancies. What, what happened last week? How did you deal with it? And, uh, you know, what's the the lesson you take away from this, watching how this played out. Yeah, so our markets were unaffected and the technology that we provide to other market operators around the world were unaffected and the technology we provide to our clientele was unaffected. So we were, um, you know, we were you know, largely unaffected. We had some internal PCs that were affected, but we were able to rectify that quickly. So, but there's always lessons learned from those types of situations. So as you mentioned, redundancy is critically important, as well as thinking about your architecture, understanding how the software, both your own software and third-party software is kind of integrated into your solution and making sure that you're thinking about that from a redundancy perspective, I think is a, is a critical part of uh, building that resilience that our clients rely on us for. You know, we are as a critical infrastructure provider ourselves. We provide critical infrastructure technology now to banks, brokers, and exchanges. So we are constantly learning from situations like this, and I think that's the best thing we can do to, to, to make sure that we, we also look at it and say, how can we improve even though we weren't affected by this particular situation?